Welcome to Canon Conversation. Yesterday we started a series where we're talking about the Christian game. Basically how churches will use uh, their philosophies, their vain philosophies, their deceit to uh, get you to give them the, your money and power. And uh, they're not really following what God and His Word said. says. We talked about the church, man's church being God. Um, yesterday and so today we're going to talk about the pastor being God he's like the God within the God system of the, of the church there well basically whatever the pastor says goes you know if you look at fundamental churchianity at their statement of faith um, they're all going to, they pretty much all have the same exact thing when it comes to the Bible we believe the Bible to be the inspired Word of God without error in its original writings. So if you just happen to have a copy of the original writing, or not the copy, you can't have a copy. If you just happen to have the original writings and you happen to understand those, uh, there are no original writings available today. Um, and if they were, you wouldn't understand them because languages have changed so much over time. So, so what they're doing is they're saying a document that existed thousands of years ago that does not exist today is God's perfect inspired word preserved, not preserved, but God's perfect inspired word without error. And if you were to just so happen to have that, then uh, it would be perfect and you can rely upon it for, for living. But uh, no one has that. Now all we've got is copies and they're in different languages uh, you know than the originals and we can't really trust in those because there have been errors throughout the years in the translations uh, and then the copies so the translations weren't perfect then the copies you get messed up on down through the line so they don't believe in the doctrine of preservation now the, the Bible says Psalm 12 the Word of God is pure as silver refined in a fire seven times. Uh, that's how pure God's word is. And God says he will preserve them. He will keep God's word forever. Modern translations change that to keeping Israel, not keeping his word. But you got other verses. The word of God stands forever. Heaven and earth shall pass away. My word shall not pass away. There shall be uh, one jot or one tittle shall pass from this law until all be fulfilled. So you got Timothy, when Paul is writing to Timothy, he tells him uh, the Word of God is inspired, but he says that you've known the Holy Scriptures since you were a child. So he calls the copies that Timothy has as holy. And maybe even more importantly, Jesus having the Old Testament, some of it being written 1,500 years before he was born, and Jesus is able to I rely upon every single word of that document. When Satan changes it around and adds a little phrase, lest at any time, he adds the words at any time there to the to God's inspired word. Jesus can trust so much in his preserved copy of the scriptures that he knows that Satan has added that and uh, and he can't and Satan has twisted it and so he doesn't trust in what Satan says so we know from God's word God's promise to preserve it Jesus relied upon it he'd say the scripture saith Isaiah saith David says you know every he quotes these people and he relies upon every word he says man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God so he's going to rely upon the Old Testament knowing it's God's Word. You see, if I wrote, like I've written commentaries, and uh, there will come a time, let's say the rapture doesn't take place for another 2,000 years. 2,000 years from now, someone's reading my commentary. Well, you can't really trust in every word of that being correct because um, I've been dead 1,900 something years. So I can't verify, yeah, that's my words. You know, things could have been changed around. I don't know, I'm dead, you know, 1900 years. I can't tell you, uh, I won't be around to tell you. And uh, languages changed during that time. 
But the thing is, God is the one who created languages, and God never dies. So God wrote his word, he promised to preserve it, and he's alive during this whole time, the last couple thousand years, to be true and preserve his word. Fundamental Church Andy all the time talking about, oh, you're limiting the power of God when you say, you know, physical miracles aren't for today or, you know, whatever it is. Oh, you're limiting God. God never changes. But yet they're the ones limiting God by changing his word around. Well, you know, yeah, it's inspired. It's perfect in the original writings, but uh, we don't have those. So we need, and, and what it is, the reason they do that, the reason they don't believe in the doctrine of preservation is because now they can make the pastor the authority. The pastor is God. It brings God's word down on man's level. That fundamental churchianity, although they say it's the word of God, that we believe it, it's true, they're really talking about a document that hasn't existed for 2,000 years. A document in the original writings. That's what they're saying is God's perfect word. But nobody has that. Oh, well, then I got to come along and tell you where the mistranslations are, where the copyist errors are. And they're going to tell you that based upon manipulating it around to fit their doctrine. So they have what they believe. And wherever it contradicts verses that they're reading, well, there was a, there was a copyist error. Well, there was a translation error. You know, the languages don't match exactly. Even though God created the languages, they don't match. So we, there's no equivalent for that in the English. I think it's funny they'll use that with the word love. They'll say, oh, well, there were, you know, the Greeks had 10 different words for love. We only have one. And so uh, you, can't, uh, you can't really understand what God was saying because you can't understand the different words for love. Well, we've got different words for love, but the modern translation, take them out. 1 Corinthians 13, the word for God's love is charity. And you see that mentioned throughout 1 Corinthians 13 is, is the unconditional love of God is called charity in 1 Corinthians 13. But all the modern translations take it out and change it to love. So we had a word to describe God's love, charity, and the modern translations, they take it out and they reduce it to one. So they dumb down the word of God. They don't make it as... As wonderful, one of the great characteristics of God is He's long suffering. Suffering long, a hundred years in the days of Noah till Noah's family would be saved. He's long suffering. But they take that out, replace it with patience. Where patience is in your Bible, where long suffering is in there too. There's a difference. Long suffering is I'm not just waiting, patience is waiting. Long suffering is I'm waiting and I'm suffering while I'm waiting. <laughs> They take that out. So what they're doing is they're bringing the Bible with the modern translations and the idea rejecting the doctrine of preservation. What they're doing is they are bringing the Bible down to man's level, looking at it from man's point of view and from a human perspective. And then what that does is it enables them to change it to meet their doctrine. So now the pastor is God. And our flesh is automatically, because our flesh thinks on man's level, it's, it will make sense to the flesh. A great example is, it, say there's something wrong with my body. Well, you say, okay, I don't know what it is. I got some health issue. So I go to the doctor. And the doctor says it's whatever it is. Well, then you just go with it. The doctor is considered to be God in our society. If the doctor says you've got this disease, this ailment, whatever it is, and the solution is to take this prescription or to do this procedure, um, most people just do it. They don't, they don't question it because they recognize and say, well, the doctor went to medical school for what, eight years, let's say. He went, uh, had an internship, he had residency, and he spent, you know, over 10 years getting to the point where he could become an official MD, doctor of medicine. It took him over 10 years to do that. Um, all I know is very little. You know, I don't have any of that medical training. I've never read any uh, medical textbooks. And so if the doctor says that I've got this condition 
that I need this procedure or I need to take this medication. I just go with it because he's the expert. He knows about that stuff. So people view the pastor of the church as being like that. Because what they've done is they've taken the Bible. They've taken it away from your ability to understand it. 500 years ago when the Protestant Reformation started, then you had the Bible and eventually the King James Version came out to where people could read it in their own language. They can understand it. It can make sense. They did not have to go to the Catholic Church to tell them what God wants them to do. They could read God's Word, the Bible, and read it, understand it, and believe what it says. And what uh, churchianity has done in the last couple hundred years is they've taken that out of man's hands. First, they've done it with modern translations to where it is no longer God's preserved word because they've changed it to fit their doctrine. I think it's funny that fundamental churchianity will accuse Jehovah Witnesses of changing God's word around to fit their doctrine because they came out with the New World Translation and so they got places like they don't believe Jesus is God. So in John 1.1 1, 1, it says the word was God. They'll change it to the word was a God. And so then fundamental churchianity to say, well, see there, because you don't believe in the deity of Christ, you came out, you had to come up with your own translation to come up with your own views. So you've got your own views that fit your translation. And they don't recognize that they're calling the cattle black. The pot calling the kettle black is they're doing the exact same thing. They have, use a modern translation that changes things around to keep you from understanding eternal security, who you are in Christ, uh, you know, all the fundamentals, uh, right division, the mystery, all the fundamentals of the faith you don't see, you know, it's changed around, it's twisted around. You, you can still see it, but it's a lot harder in a modern translation than a King James Bible. And so what they've done then is they've instituted the pastor now as God. So the pastor, whenever there's a verse and you say, because you're reading the Bible, and you say, well, this doesn't make sense because our church teaches, you know, such and such. But this verse here teaches something different. Well, the most accurate translate, that's a bad translation. The most accurate translation is this. You know, it's like you read Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Oh, well, you told us that the church started in Acts 2. I'm reading in Acts 2, and it says that I have to be water baptized to be saved. But you teach that water baptism is somebody who's already saved, and it's an outward manifestation of an inward work of grace. So, what's going on here? And the pastor says, well, that's a bad translation. It should say in Acts 2.38, according to the Greek, ice, e -I -S, that word there, it, if it was translated correctly, it would say that they needed to be water baptized um, because they've already been forgiven of their sins. So it's really teaching what we teach. And then you're thinking, well, you know, I've never taken any Greek, Koine Greek. I don't know anything about that. I haven't been to seminary school, and my pastor's done that. So who am I to question him? So when you've got, what they've done is they've taken God's preserved word, they've changed it around in modern translations to where it's harder to find the truth. And you can still find verses that will contradict what the church teaches. And so when you do, of course you go to the pastor because he's the authority. And then he'll tell you that that was a bad translation and here's what it should be. Or in the context, it really means this other thing, which of course it doesn't. And so what they do then is now, so they take God's word out of your hands by changing it around in these modern versions. And if they, if you do happen to read and believe it and find a contradiction with what the, what the doctrine of the church is, well then you've got the pastor as God to tell you that uh, what the Holy Ghost is teaching you through that passage is wrong and what the church is saying is right. And who are you to question the pastor? It's like, who am I to question the doctor? The doctor has some fancy name for some medical condition that I have. I know there's something wrong with me. And he's given me a fancy name and he's given me a prescription. So I'm just gonna go along with it. Who am I to question the doctor? I don't have any medical training. So it's the same thing with the pastor. Who am I to question the pastor? I don't have any seminary training. I don't know anything about Greek and Hebrew. 
So if I can't trust the Bible that's in my hand, um, then I got to go to the pastor. And the pastor is going to tell me, uh, give me some good training. Basically what seminary school does is it teaches you how to lie. It teaches you uh, how to twist God's word to fit the doctrinal statement of the seminary school, which is why if you try to become a Baptist pastor, they're not going to let you be a Baptist pastor unless you're a seminary graduate of a Baptist seminary. If I went to Notre Dame, got a doctorate of theology from Notre Dame, and I want to be a Baptist pastor, they're not going to let me do that because I'm trained in the Catholic way of looking at Scripture. They want people who are trained in the Baptist way of Scripture. you got to know how to lie like a Baptist and not lie like a Catholic. And so that's what they're looking for. And then what ends up happening then is the pastor becomes God. Because I don't have seminary training. I don't know anything about Greek or Hebrew. I'm just a dumb accountant who reads his Bible. Um, how do I know that it's been changed? That I can trust it in this verse, but I can't trust it in the other verse. That this verse here is an accurate translation, but this other verse is not an accurate translation. I don't know that stuff. So I have to trust in what the, uh, what the pastor tells me. So now the pastor becomes God. And it makes sense from a fleshly standpoint because we do that in other areas. So I mentioned the doctor problem. I've got an illness. I, you know, I don't know what it is. So then I go to a doctor and the doctor tells me and he gives me a prescription and I just trust what he says because I don't know that medical mumbo jumbo. I don't know, I haven't done all that studying. And what normal pe most people would do uh, when it comes to tax time, it's, well, I'm gonna take my taxes to H&R Block or to an accountant. I don't know all that tax code, I haven't read it. It's all mumbo jumbo to me, so I'll go get an expert to do it. When I got a leaky pipe at home, I don't know how to fix that. I'm going to call the plumber. You know, when my electricity isn't working, I don't know how to fix that. I'd probably electrocute myself and kill myself if I tried it. I'm going to call an electrician. So we have all this division of labor and the medical doctor, the plumber, the accountant, the electrician, and we just trust what they say. So then, uh, you know, the other day I had to take my car in. I had a flat tire, I had to get in a mechanic, put the tire, get a, you know, got a new tire and they put it on. You know, I don't know how to take the rim off of a tire and, you know, all that stuff that you do. Even if I did, I didn't have the equipment to do it. So I take it in and get a mechanic to do it. And so then people look at the Bible in the same way. Well, I don't have all that training like the pastor. The pastor is a specialist in the Bible. So then I'm just going to believe whatever he says. And so again, like we mentioned yesterday, if I am at home and I just read the Bible or I attend Bible study on YouTube on a Sunday instead of going to a church building, well then they figure I'm backslidden, I'm part of a cult, I'm not really saved because the church is God. Well, it's the same thing when it comes to reading the Bible. If I read the Bible, believe what it says, and I come up with a different interpretation than what the pastor says, I'm automatically wrong. So somebody goes to a church, say a Baptist church, for all their life, and I'm sharing right division with them. Well, how did you get that information? Well, I read the Bible. Here's what the verses say. See, they don't want to hear that because they know that you are not an expert. And in fact, they're even taught. The Bible says no scripture is of any private interpretation. See what you're doing? You're getting a private interpretation. You're reading the Bible by yourself. You can't do that. You got to have the church, the pastor tell you because he's got all the training. So you read a verse and you believe that there's a mystery dispensation that started with Paul in Acts 9. And my pastor says that Paul taught the exact same gospel that Peter did and that the church started in Acts 2. Therefore, I'm going to believe my pastor because he's got more training than you. But, you know, in a lot of cases, that's good in terms of, you know, the accountant or the electrician or the plumber. But the thing that's different about God's Word is that man did not write that book. God wrote it. And God is, man did not preserve the book. God preserved the book. And the moment that I recognize my sin and trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for my sin, the Holy Ghost is given unto me. 
and the Holy Ghost there, according to 1 Corinthians 2, 13 and 14, teaches me the deep things of God. Paul told the Thessalonians that God's word effectually worketh in those that believe. So the difference is, unlike the taxes or the plumber or the electrician, I've got the expert teaching it to me. The expert is God. The Holy Ghost is within me. He's the one teaching me God's word as I read it. Therefore, when I stay at home and I read the Bible and I believe it, uh, allow the Holy Ghost to teach it to me, that's not a private interpretation. That's God's interpretation of God's word. And that's the only interpretation that I can rely on 100%. But when I go to a Baptist church and the pastor is telling me he was taught by man at the seminary school how to read the Bible, uh, he uses the man's interpretation of the Bible and gives you that explanation. So when the scripture says no scripture is of, no prophecy is of any private interpretation, it means that you cannot understand the scripture by going to a private institution like a Baptist church, a Catholic church, a Methodist church, whatever, and having it teach you what God's word says. When you do that, that's the private interpretation. It says no, pro no prophecy of scripture is given of any private interpretation, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So that right there tells you the definition of a private interpretation is looking at it from man's point of view. Whereas the definition of learning the scripture is the Holy Ghost teaches you the things of God. I mean, that's what that scripture tells you. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So when my soul speaks the truth that my spirit learns from the Holy Ghost teaching it to me as I read and believe God's word, um, then that is God's uh, word, God's interpretation of God's word telling me that. But when a pastor tells me what it says, he's going by man's interpretation from the seminary, from what his church doctrine is, and he then is not given the Holy Ghost interpretation or God's interpretation of it, he's giving man's interpretation of it. And that's where the danger is. So they think that I am of a cult or I'm doing a private interpretation and you can't trust what I'm saying because I'm not going to the expert, the pastor. But in truth, I'm going to someone who's a far greater expert than the pastor and that is God himself dwelling within me, teaching me the things of God. The best expert of God's word is God and God teaches me God's word as I read and believe it. And if I go to the pastor, now I'm going to a man-made system and I'm getting man to teach me God's word. That's why when Jesus spoke, the crowds were amazed. He says, they, he speaks with authority and not as the scribes. And people say, well, that's because he was God in the flesh. Well, he was God in the flesh. But the reason is because he read God's word. He believed what it said. God the Father taught it to him. And so the authority and power that came from Jesus' words was the very words of God that he was speaking to them. That was the authority and it's because he studied it out and let God teach it to him. Whereas what the scribes did is they were teaching the man-made system. That's why when people get into right division, the Bible just opens up for them and they can't believe how much they're learning and growing and it all makes sense. Well, that's because they're listening to God teach it to them and not man. So the problem with churchianity in that Christian game is that I can't read the Bible myself and believe what it says. I got to go to man. But we should know that we have God's word that's preserved for us without error in a King James Bible and that God himself dwells within us after we're saved to teach us his word. And that's how we understand it. There's the power behind it. That's how we live for Christ, living by the faith of the Son of God, letting God teach us God's word instead of man teaching us man's interpretation of God's word. Thanks for watching.